We'll call this meeting to order of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, today is committee day. I'm Chairman Kurt Holbert, and I'd like to welcome each one of you today uh, to the Holly Fort Shooting Complex um, here in Henry County. Danette, would you call the roll, please? Ripley? Here. Tony Sanders? Here. James Stroud? Here. Kent Wood? Here. Tommy Wood? Here. Hank Wright? Here. Angie Box? Here. Brian McLaren? Here. Kurt Holbert? Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Danette. Um, I would like to take a minute to welcome some guests we have today, and we may leave somebody out. Um, we got Ben West from Lone Oak here. Uh, Commissioner of Agriculture, Dr. Charlie Hatcher, sitting on the end down there. Um, Mike Butler, Tennessee Wildlife Federation. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dyes from the Tennessee Fur Harvesters Association. Uh, Steve Lambert, Code Blue, Deer Scent. Phil Robinson from Tinks. Sam Bergeson from Wildlife Research Center, Incorporated. Stephen Buttry from Buttry Government Relations. Um, hopefully I didn't leave anybody out, but I'm sure I did. Without uh, any further delay, I'm going to call on Mr. Darren Ryder, if he would, just a minute. Thank you, Chairman Holbert. Uh, <clears throat> it's quite an honor, I guess, or privilege to make a, just a quick announcement for recognition. We have a gentleman sitting there at the door this will be his last commission meeting his name is brian thompson he's a major for law enforcement in region one his retirement date is june 17th i believe and he has 34 years career with the agency and i believe he started out in hardeman county as a wildlife officer then he went to back in the day was an area of enforcement areas and he was an area assistant supervisor then he became the Hunter Ed Boater Education Coordinator for Region 1 for a few years, and then he went promoted again to a area supervisor of Old District, well, Area 11. Is that is that right, Brian? And contrary to popular belief, I, I, he's not Major Payne. It's really, <laughs> he got referred to a lot during his career when he became Major as Major Payne. So, Brian, uh, I think there's forthcoming retirement get-togethers down the road, so we just want to take this time knowing that this was going to be your last commission meeting and you're on the verge of retirement, and thank you for your service. I think Commissioner Cannon has got a video that he did for you. Ready? Okay. Wednesday morning. Chairman gave me a call and asked if I wanted to say a few words about Brian Thomas. Oh, yeah. I figured this is a pretty appropriate setting as much as Brian works out in bikes. So I decided to have this filmed in front of my daughter's CrossFit gym. Brian, if you ever need a place to work out in Knoxville, we have the place for you. When he asked me to say a few words, it told me one thing in particular, and that is your agenda is way too short and you needed somebody with the gift of gab to kind of fill some time. So I'm going to do my best to do that, but do it about my friend, and that is BT. I got to interact with BT quite a bit during my six years uh, on the commission, but most particularly that last year when I was the chair. Uh, he was gracious enough to take me to the field on the opening day of dove season in West Tennessee. I got to travel with him. I got to see how he interacted not only with the officers under his charge, but how he interacted with the public. Without question, and frankly, I already knew this, and most of you do too, we could not have had a better representative, a better ambassador for the agency and for the commission. Uh, we have been most blessed by having Brian as a part of this team. Some will say today is a day that's bittersweet, that we're going to miss Brian, and we are. 
and that's the bitter part, and it's a sweet time in that it's an opportunity to celebrate him and that he's got some remarkable time ahead. That's also true. I just want to say it's a sweet time today because we get to acknowledge the legacy that Brian has left us. You look at his officers. You look at how they handle themselves with the public. And what you see is Brian. He has truly mentored this staff in the way that, and the man that he is. You take a look at our agency. Look at the impacts he's had. Our agency and commission are a better place because of Brian. Brian, yeah, we're going to miss you. And we are going to celebrate this legacy that you're leaving us. Uh, it's been so good, and you've been so good to us. But I'll leave you all with these words, and that is, we've talked about the professional side of Brian. My personal measure is a truly how the man acts away from work. And we've all got to see that. We've seen how he has truly cared for those under him. Yes, they were officers. Yes, that's the professional side. But you can tell it's much deeper than that. He cares and loves for each of those folks well. And that's something that we would all strive. But a greater measure is how he loves his family. And we have gotten to see that in spades, particularly how he has loved and cared for his wife for these years uh, with no fanfare. He's never sought it. He's kept it to himself. That's the kind of guy he is. And I can think of no better benchmark for any of us, men or women, than the example that Brian has shared. So Brian, thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being who you are. And I think I would say on behalf of all the staff and the commission, each of us is personally better for having had the chance to be around you and watch you and have a little bit of you rub off on us. Enjoy this time, celebrate this time, and I think you have some remarkable days ahead. Take care, my friend. out whether you're going to afford him the mic or not I, I, I say no but that's up to you <laughs> attention Kmart shoppers for the next five minutes I've enjoyed it it's been a great place to be for the last 34 and a half years almost 35 great people to work for and with so uh, hey I got paid to do what I got to do had a lot of fun doing it a lot of fun I might add some things we can't repeat, some things everybody knows already. And some people have pictures of some things. So thank y'all. I gotta look at Bobby because I got pictures of him too. <laughs> they've they've been I've heard quite, I've heard people asking for pictures of you, Brian, so just be aware and so on. Thank y'all. You're too kind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. All right, uh, without delay, I'm going to turn it over to our wildlife chairman, Commissioner Dennis Gardner. All right, um, welcome everybody and thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm just going to preface this with saying that uh, this is my first chairman meeting and it's going to, it could be a little rough, uh, bear with me. Tracy, keep me straight, I uh, appreciate that. Um, um, I want to start off by saying I got the chance to attend the CWD meeting at uh, Fate Academy uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I just want to commend everybody that had a part in putting that on. Uh, what a first-class operation it was! It, it was uh, it was well attended, and uh, it had some great questions in there with with the hunters uh, that weren't just um, crying over spilt milk, so to speak. Uh, they were genuinely concerned about where do we go from here and how do we get there and uh it generated some great questions uh that without the quality information from dr grove chuck and, and james uh probably wouldn't have generated that kind of questions or left them feeling like they had a a, a real role and a key part in in uh trying to address this problem that's uh 
uh, so that's gotten into a few of our counties. So thank you very much, and, and uh, I, th I thought it was impressive. Um, with that, I, I want to start off with uh, calling Bobby, um, uh, Bobby Wilson, uh, to talk about the, the funding. We're going to get into some funding issues, so now might be the time for you to go ahead and do that, or would you rather prefer to wait? Um, Okay. All right. So the first one is uh, Proclamation 1902, uh, Manner and Means of, of Hunting and uh, Trapping. Um, I'm not sure. Is that Chris over Kate? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What this is going to be, it's going to be an amendment. It'll be 1902 as an amendment to our Manner and Means Proclamation, which is 1805. And Quite simply, this is going to be a small change in wording relative to the survey during um, portion we had in the manner and means. So the amendment to Proclamation 1805 allowing use of certified survey urine for hunting. This proclamation will allow the use of certified survey urine for hunting and amends Proclamation 1805 Section 2, Subsection 8L. And we'll see that going through here. It, it deletes this section in Proclamation 1805. Survey urine except synthetic for hunting, though prohibition of this use or possession during the hunting season will not become effective till March 1st, 2019. We set that off so that the, the vendors could prepare for that, and that's why that was wording was such as it was. So it'll delete that section, and it'll replace, 1902 amendment will replace this part and say the use or possession of natural survey urine while hunting is prohibited unless the product is clearly labeled bearing certification from the manufacturer that the urine was produced by a facility that number one complies with a federal or federally approved chronic wasting disease herd certification program and any federal chronic wasting disease protocols and record requirements number two does not allow the importation of live cervids Number three, requires that all cervids exported from the facility be tested for chronic wasting disease upon death and the, facility, and the results are reported to that facility. Number four, is inspected annually by an accredited veterinarian, including inspection of the herd and applicable records. And number five, maintains a fence at least eight feet high around the facility and the facility is located with, if the facility is located within 30 miles of a confirmed positive, occurrence of chronic wasting disease is double fenced to prevent direct contact between captives and wild cervids. So with that, any questions? Are there any questions from the Wildlife Committee? Any other commission members? Any questions from the public? I'll make, I'll make a motion that this pass as presented. I got a motion to uh, pass this uh, Second. Uh, 1902 and seconded by uh, Commissioner Box. Motion by Commissioner Sanders. And uh, so I guess take a. Is there any discussion? I see no discussion. Um, we'll vote for the uh, passage of 1902 of uh, the Wildlife Committee. Uh, I'll say. Uh, Say aye if, uh, if you vote for it. Aye. aye. Anybody against? All right, the ayes have it. Uh, motion passes, or proclamation passes. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I told you it'd be rough. Wildlife preserve rule, uh, primarily those large uh, big game facilities that have cervids. Uh, what we will be doing in this amendment is just this is the review of this, and of course, if you have any questions or comments, uh, we're happy to take those. It will allow preserves that are permitted for cervids 
to acquire service inside the Tennessee. Presently, regardless of where they obtain their service that are CWD susceptible, they have to be in a monitoring program for at least five years, whether they import it or acquire them in state. This rule amendment will allow in-state service facilities that have CWD susceptible species, once they are enrolled in a herd monitoring program as prescribed by the new survey facility rules that have been adopted by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, those, sir, those preserves may acquire animals in state. It does not change the importation requirements that are set by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. There, so therefore there will be no more enrollment for at least five years. This will allow those facilities in state that we do not have any disease status information on to get those animals once harvested and tested to see where those facilities are at. Uh, it clarifies action taken in regard to escapes. We have one section there that talks about elk. Elk are the only native service, but in the captivity, they're class three out from under our jurisdiction. This amendment clarifies that. It also requires preserves to report escapes of non-indigenous mammals held to the Tennessee Department of Agriculture within 24 hours. And this will allow them to exercise their jurisdiction over those species. The only thing we will do is we will be notified and we will allow the taking uh, of that animal if it's outside the facility. It cleans up the rule. Um, went through and edited. You can see we put everything in terms of the facilities and in inches. It didn't go from feet to inches. Uh, edited, corrected the grammar, spelling, and again, the, uh, the continuities there. Any questions about this rule amendment? Are there any questions from the Wildlife Committee? That's awful loud. Any questions from the rest of the commission? Uh, from the public? All right. Um, I blew up another one. Uh, this one. That's three now. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, since this is a preview, we won't be voting on it. Uh, I would assume this gets presented back to us in May. Is that correct? It, you will probably see it if it's filed in May. Maybe at the June. June. Maybe okay. it, there's a. I, I forget how many days there is once we file till it comes back to y'all. But yes, the, either the June or the July commission. All meeting. right. So it's informational for us to, uh, for a future meeting. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate that, and uh, I guess no questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Dr. Hatcher to give us a update on uh, on the possibilities of in-state uh, in uh, lab testing for CWD, if you don't mind. Thank you. Well, thank you for giving me the mic. That's a little dangerous. I am disappointed I wasn't invited for the fishing nor what I didn't, didn't get the memo about dressing down for the whole thing. So, Kurt, that's not good. Talk about it. <laughs> okay. Not that you're that person. I just, you know. All right. Well, well really, the main message uh, I want to convey is uh, departments in this together with TWRA. We've got a good relationship with the commission and, and with the agency. We want to continue to improve on that. CWD is is here forever now uh it's here to stay we want to do what we can on the captive side that's that's under our purview and so it was uh i really wanted to for our cord state lab to be able to test for cwd so we're going to make that happen and um i've already directed my people to, to begin planning for that and we would hope that we would get it in place by this fall for hunting season because we can test captive service, which we should anyhow. We want to test as many captive service as we can. And thank you, Wally, for that preview, because that allows us, hunting preserves is one of our best source to get samples, and we got to have those samples to establish prevalence and make sure it's not. So thank you very much, and look forward to y'all passing that. Uh, but we do plan on trying to get uh, operational by this fall to, to uh, 
and also I've talked to Dr. Tim Cross and, and they're gonna try to get up to speed as well. So at least you have some backup, but we're, uh, we're more than glad to do that and wanna do that in, in, in helping the CWD response. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Okay. Hatcher, and uh, I appreciate you. Uh, just, does anybody have any questions of the Wildlife Committee before he steps away? Thank you very much. It's great to hear that we're gonna have uh, some in-state testing. That's, uh, that's something that we've gotta have. Uh, there's a lot of concern about it. I mentioned how many people were at the, uh, the meeting at Fayette Academy, and it just shows you what the level of interest is and everybody's concerned about our herd and, and, uh, and also taking it home to put on the table. So thank you very much. All right, uh, next uh, I'd like to have uh, Bobby Wilson come up and uh, uh, we're fixing to do a couple of budget items and you're, he's gonna preview what where federal dollars come from and give uh, kind of an explanation of how it all works so that uh, everybody, uh, we got five new commissioners and it's just better if everybody knows how, how it all goes. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Garner. Um, I, what, I don't really have a full-blown presentation about all the federal aid uh, and what the sources, where they come from, but I did, did want to point out some things with, is federal aid in relation to the upcoming budget expansions. And then I also want to point out um, this is a different process than it has been in the past as far as budget expansions go. We have four today. We have two in the Wildlife uh, Committee and two in the Retention and Recruitment Committee. And uh, typically they would go under the straight to begin with at the budget committee, and then they would, if approved, they would go to the budget committee to be presented to the full commission tomorrow. But two are gonna go before the wildlife committee first. If the wildlife committee approves those, uh, and if the retention and re recruitment committee approves the two under their purview, then they will go to the budget committee at the end of this, towards the end of the meeting on the agenda. The budget committee then will consider those, and if they approve those, then it goes before the full uh, commission tomorrow. The other thing about the federal aid, these, all four of these are 100% federal aid, so there's no state dollars involved. In other words, it's not a match required. Um, we all, we try to protect our state dollars, which are the licensed dollars for the most part, as much as we can. And if there's a project that comes about, whether it's an expansion project or just a typical project, if we can get a match uh, from outside source other than our state dollars, then we're good. Uh, sometimes we use wetlands dollars, sometimes we use uh, fuel tax dollars if it's, but, but the license dollars is what we try to protect so we don't have to uh, use up our reserves uh, too quickly and then have to figure out another way to, to fund it, whether it's a license increase or something else. So all four of these uh, today will be 100% uh, federal dollars. P uh, and they are Pittman-Robertson, which is the wildlife, the hunting side of things, and then uh, the edu wildlife education or hunter education dollars which are also part of the Pitt and Robertson dollars too. So, um, and the other thing is the, the very first one uh, Jamie Federson is gonna present is a, is a big ticket item. Uh, but again, it's all 100% federal aid and the dollars used, these are, this is uh, money well spent, we feel like just because it's gonna go towards answering some questions that we have uh, on research to help us better manage our, especially our waterfowl and wetlands areas and our, and our waterfowl. So that's all I had to say about that. All right, thank you, Bobby. I appreciate the clarification. Are there any questions for Bobby before he uh, steps down? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right, uh, next I'd like to go to uh, budget expansion uh, for the Tennessee Tech waterfowl, and that's going to be Jamie Federson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, today, I'd like to take a little bit of time to chat with you about uh, some uh, a research proposal that um, the agency would like to uh, engage in looking at how mallards use uh, wetlands in West Tennessee. Uh, I'm going to chat with you, laying it out how uh, important that Tennessee is to ducks, how ducks are important to Tennessee, uh, what affects the numbers in Tennessee, what people are saying about ducks in Tennessee, uh, and then lay out the need uh, for, for this research, and then I'll hit you with the project details. 
So looking at this classic map, I think most everybody who's, who's a duck hunter has probably seen this map of the Mississippi Flyway. And you know everybody knows that ducks breed up north in, in uh, the prairie potholes and, and up through the boreal forest in Canada. But if you look at that map and how they funnel down along the river systems and really look at the first major congregation point uh, for them, it's, it's really right there where Tennessee is. So we are really the first major concentration of migrating ducks. They all come together right on top of us. So we're really at the bottom of the funnel for the Mississippi Flyway and all those birds then head down the Mississippi River um, onto their wintering areas. A lot of them stay with us. Uh, so I wanted to put some actual numbers. What does that actually really mean? And so there's this midwinter waterfowl survey uh, every year during the first week of January um, all of the states and the federal government uh, across the nation, uh, we do a, a, a survey of all waterfowl within that same week. So we sort of get this snapshot of where all the ducks are at one time. And what we see is, looking at this graph, and, and, and I've laid out the graph so that the northern states are at the top of the graph and the southern states are at the bottom of the graph. So you see Louisiana really dominates, you know, Lots of ducks are hanging out in Louisiana, and I think we all know that. But if you look at the orange bars, those, that's Tennessee. We're, we're, we're pretty darn comparable to our, to our neighbors. You know, we hold almost as many ducks as Arkansas, and we hold just as many ducks as Missouri. Really want you to focus in on this box. That's sort of the, that funnel point where I had on that, first, on that map where you've got Tennessee, Kentucky, Southern Missouri, Northeast Arkansas. Look at how the bars are. Tennessee is right there, you know. We, we hold a lot of ducks, and I think people forget that. Giving you actual numbers, about during this, during this week, we average about 635,000 ducks in Tennessee. That's about 9% of all of the ducks that are counted during the survey in the Mississippi Flyway. 603 of those are dabbling ducks. Those are your mallards, your gadwall, your teal, your pintails. And we've got 11% of all of the birds that are counted during that week here in Tennessee. But what's really going to hit you is this next number I throw at you. Of that 603,000, that's how many mallards we have. 470,000 are mallards. That's 18% of all of the mallards counted in the Mississippi Flyway are in Tennessee at this time. Amazing considering our, all you ever hear is Arkansas. Louisiana has you know 50% of the birds in the count, but we're holding 18% of the mallards. That's huge, that's a, that's a great number. To really put it into perspective, here are our neighbors. Here are the, the states that are our biggest competitors when it comes to duck hunting. Arkansas is holding 26% of the mallards at that time. Missouri is holding 16%. So we're right in the fight with both of those states. We're actually doing a little bit better than Missouri. So if, if you're thinking about how important mallards are to duck hunting, think about how important Tennessee is to, 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 to mallards. So flip that and think about how ducks are important to Tennessee. If 74% of the ducks that we get in Tennessee during this time are mallards, well, mallard you know, the greenhead is king when it comes to duck hunting. That's the, that's the duck everybody wants to go out and hunt. So, <laughs> Commissioner Gardner, was that you again blowing another one up? <laughs> <laughs> so, if you, so thinking about, you know, mallards being really important to, uh, to, to duck hunters and 74% of the ducks that we get are mallards, uh, you know, that places a lot of importance to the duck in Tennessee. We've got Real Foot Lake. I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room how important Real Foot Lake is to the history of duck hunting, um, but people outside of the state realize that Real Foot Lake has a, a long history. It's, it's legendary. And, and if you're a real duck hunter, on your bucket list is to hunt Real Foot Lake at some point, not just in Tennessee. I mean, I remember being you know, younger and hearing about Real Foot Lake, and that's, that's a place I wanted to go. Um, Looking at how many duck hunters we have annually are uh, the, the estimates that we get uh, from, our, from our HIP um, questionnaire uh, shows that we have about 11,000 duck hunters. Um, you know, that's a, a number on average um, between 2011 and 2017. 
And those, uh, those hunters spend about 90,000 days of field, so that equals about 8.2 ducks, or 8.2 days, about eight days per hunter. And so thinking about duck hunters going out and spending money, a 2006 economic impact study of waterfowl hunting showed that Tennessee hunters spend about $30 million on just their trips and equipment. So just spending the money, getting to where they want to be, buying their decoys, buying their shells. But if you factor in them stopping at the gas station and buying soda and candy bars and you know stopping at the mom and pop store and getting a, a sausage biscuit, that total output comes up to about $50 million. And commissioners, I don't think I need to tell you, I think you all know, especially if you're in West Tennessee, how important duck hunting is to the small communities out there. They really rely on duck hunters stopping in at these mom and pop stores and bringing in the revenue for them. So um, duck hunting is a really strong um, economic driver. Uh, I want to talk to you about what affects duck numbers in Tennessee. Certainly weather, and I know that those are geese on the picture. I just like the picture, but I really wanted to get the point home that this is not something that we can control. It doesn't matter how cold or how warm it is, we can't do anything about that. So weather is a, it, it drives numbers, but it's not something we can control. What we can control is habitat, food, water. We can actively provide that stuff for ducks at the right time, at the right locations when they need it, and, and, and try to provide the best that we can. That's something we can control. Hunting pressure is something we can control. This is a pretty drastic map, and this is one of our hunting areas. But you think if you're a duck flying through there, how many times you're going to get shot at, that's going to impact whether or not, as a duck, you want to stay in that area. So we have the ability to regulate hunting pressure. Refuge, that's another big factor. If ducks have a place that they can go to and sit down and not get shot at, that is really going to affect whether, whether or not they want to stick around and, and, and be in the area. And so one thing Tennessee is really good at is providing refuge. We provide a lot of refuge. Um, this map shows, you look at the, the white flags, if you can see those, those are national wildlife refuges, and there's 10 of them up there. The blue arrows, those are state wildlife refuges. Those are the, the refuges that TWRA operates and there are 10 of those. Um, the hunting areas are the red H's and there's 15 of those. So we actually have more, more locations where we provide refuge than we do provide hunting. Now, I'm not saying that the e acreages are equal. I, I don't know, I, I, I sort of thought about that afterwards. I thought, oh, maybe somebody's gonna ask me that, but I couldn't tell you what the acreage is, but when you factor in all of the acres of refuge and all of the acres of public hunting, I think they're sort of washing out. They're, they're, they're pretty even. So what do people think about refuges in Tennessee? Hunters are saying, we're lucky we got a duck hunting lease so close to a refuge because it provides a source of ducks for us. Ducks are in the refuge, they're going to come over to us. We got the other folks that say, we got a duck hunting lease and we just can't compete with all the public areas and the refuges because they suck all the birds all away from us and we can't, we can't hunt them. The first camp says we need the refuges, that attracts them and keeps the ducks there. The other camp says hunting would be better if we could hunt the refuges and get the ducks to spread out. What our managers are saying, they're saying we need the refuges in the area to attract and keep ducks. They're also saying hunting the refuges would be better to get the ducks to spread out. So we got two camps there, both from the hunters, both from the managers. Which camp is right? I think both of them are right. I think there's, a, there's a, an, an intermediate phase in there that as an agency, I think we can find the, the, the right, the sweet spot of refuge and, and, and hunt areas. Our managers also say we're really good at, at creating habitat, providing good management for our ducks, and they, they, they are. We've got great managers. They do a really good job putting habitat on the ground and keeping ducks in the area. But they also say we need a better understanding of how ducks use our areas, when they use them, where on our areas they're using them, why, why they're using them in, in the first place. And that's going to help us be more efficient and more effective in our management. And that's something as an agency we're always tr striving to do. We're always looking to do things better. How can we do it better? How can we do it more effectively? How can we do it more efficiently? So 
that leads us to, if you're thinking about mallards using wetlands in Tennessee, what are the things you got to look at? What do you got to think about in order to give the managers what they need as far as information to do better management? Well, I say it's all of this. You got to think about how private land is impacting um, duck use versus your public land, how disturbance on both areas are, are impacting it. What are the refuge effects? How are ducks using habitat? What's the hunter pressure like? All of these interact with each other. So it's not just one thing that we can answer. It's all of them. We have to try to answer all of them together. And that brings me to what do we need? We need a comprehensive assessment of how mallards use wetland areas throughout uh, our state-owned areas, the WMAs, the refuges, in, in, in Tennessee in general, but we're going to focus on West Tennessee. Really the how, when, where, why mallards use wetlands. So it brings me to the project. Um, I've been talking with Dr. Brad Cohen at Tennessee Tech. We've uh, cooked up this, uh, this, this project, and so we would propose engaging in a contract with Tennessee Tech for four years, three full field seasons, um, you can see Brad Cohen is the principal investigator, but we've also got some other project investigators on there as well. Dr. Dan Combs from Tennessee Tech is going to be involved. We've got Dr. Rick Garhold from the University of Tennessee looking at disease stuff. Dr. Jared Henson, he's going to look at uh, body health and, and, and body condition of the ducks. He's at Christian Brothers University. Dr. Heath Hagee with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And then, of course, not Dr. Me is going to be involved feel insignificant on that list, but, but I, I have something to contribute. Anyway, so what is the project? Really, we want to look at how mallards move across uh, the landscape, particularly in West Tennessee and, and, the and our neighboring states. What are the areas that mallards select for within our, 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 our lands, our WMAs, our refuges? And what are the factors that really influence the movements amongst these areas? This, this, this is really the, the burning question right here is what what puts a duck in Tennessee and what keeps them in Tennessee? So that's really the crux of it right there. The specific deliverables from the project, what, we, what, what, I, what, what I hope that we're gonna get at the end of this is that we're gonna be able to evaluate the spatial use the, or the spatial factors, the, the temporal factors that influence how waterfowl use our all different areas, not just the public areas, but private areas as well. Um, really want to uh, think we're going to get to be able to assess the factors that influence those movements. Um, we're going to be able to determine what influences ducks to choose certain wetlands. Is it, is it vegetation, water depth, uh, location, proximity to hunting, things like that. And then evaluate these at a landscape level and even at a, a, a smaller vegetation level to, to, to find out really what ducks are keying in on and what we need to, as managers, what we need to provide them. In the end, we're going to get a framework to be able to understand how different disturbance levels on our refuges will affect duck use, but not only that, particularly hunter success off the refuges. So can we go on to the refuges and, and have a... Right now, our refuges don't... Um, we don't allow any access onto our refuges during duck hunting. And so maybe we can offer some, something bird watchers can get out there and look at the ducks. I know this is something that they've, that, that they've been asking for for a lot of years. Can we allow them to do that? That's a certain level of disturbance that um, might get birds up off the area, help improve some hunting around the refuge, but then not lose that refuge effect. So those birds will come back and still hang out on our refuge. What level can we have that we don't lose the refuge effect on the property. And in the end, we'll get an estimate of duck use days on our areas. Duck use days are how much food that you can produce and provide for a duck to stay there for one day. And so thinking about how many birds we get, we need to provide food for a lot of ducks for a lot of days. That's what we'll get out of the end of this. What's in it for us? Again, this is all information that's gonna be able to help our managers provide really good habitat on the ground. Uh, it's going to strengthen the importance of wetland management, enhancement, and restoration in Tennessee. We all know wetland, we all know this is important, but getting these answers, get, uh, answering these questions, and getting this information will really, really drive that factor home again for us. Uh, a really good reminder. 
TWRA will be a leader in the waterfowl community when it comes to understanding the mallard movement and uh, ecology. Um, you know, people will be looking at us, at what we're doing, and people will want to know. They're, they're, they're going to be coming to us. What are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it? You know, we will be a leader in, in the wildlife community and the waterfowl community. Our stakeholders, they're getting something out of this too. We're going to continue to produce great habitat, but if we can do it better, if we can do more of it, if we can do it more cost efficient, it's good for them, it's good for us, it's good for the ducks. Um, more ducks to see, more ducks to hunt. We've got the, the potential for increased recreational opportunities. Like I said, looking at disturbance, if we can provide, um, you know, get ducks up off the refuge, make hunters um, a little bit happier because more ducks are flying around. If we can get bird watchers on the property so they can look at it, we're, we're just going to have happier stakeholders because of it. Here's the slide you've all been waiting for. How much is it going to cost? So it's a four-year project, uh, heavily weighted on the first three years because that's when our field season is going to be. So that's where the supplies, the technician, and all that come in. Uh, the last year is just generally the students finishing analyzing the data, writing the reports, things like that. So what does that sum look like together? It's an agency commitment of $1.4 million. Tennessee Tech is coming, they're coming to this game too. They're bringing a half a million dollars. And that's, that's a pretty large sum of money for a university to be, to be bringing to a research project. Total project costs on this about $2 million. As, as um, uh, Assistant Director Wilson indicated earlier, this is all federal funding. This, there's no licensed dollars that, that are going to be put towards this. It'll be all federal aid money. What our money what's our money going to get us? We're going to have two PhD students, at least one master's student, potentially a second master's student working on this, at least one technician. 120 solar GP, solar charged GPS units. These are like the new thing in tracking animals. So we're going to have very precise locations on where these birds are going to be multiple times a day. And these units will last about 18 months. We could probably get about two years out of them. Um, the, this is the type of thing that the PR we can get off of this by um, providing daily updates on where our ducks are, are, are at. You know, I think Jennifer Wisniewski would tell you that this is social media gold. Our Twitter account, our Facebook account, Instagram, it's going to go crazy. People are going to be wanting to see what our ducks are doing, when they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to have that and provide that every single day um, for the length of the project. Uh, we'll get three full years of data out of this. Uh, we're going to get the questions answered. What habitats are mallards using in Tennessee and beyond? I mean, we're going to get information about where they are not just in Tennessee. We're really going to learn the importance of the refuges to migrating and wintering waterfowl, how disturbance on those areas will affect duck use. Again, I, I think I indicated earlier, body condition, physiology, health indices. We're going to see how healthy birds are coming to Tennessee. That's where Dr. Henson from Christian Brothers University is going to come in. Disease surveillance. We're going to know, uh, we're, we're, we're going to check all of the birds that we get our hands on. And Dr. Rick Gerhold, who's working on our turkey project, doing the disease aspect of it, he's agreed to come on board and do this. So, we've already we, so we're, we're engaging in a in in a research project with Tennessee Tech, but we've got two other universities on board helping out with it. And so, it, it's that's a little unprecedented when you're starting up a research project like this. So it's a little unusual to have three different universities participating in the research. So. Uh, so it's very, really exciting. There's other things our money could get too. Um, these are questions that the data we get from these transmitters on these birds, we'll be able to answer these questions, but they're not the questions that we're actually asking, but, but, but we can get the answers to them. Winter site fidelity, do birds come back to the same areas every year? That's a great question that, you know, the, the only way, Waterfowl managers have been asking that for a long time. We think we have a good idea about it, but boy, this could really nail it home with birds that are actually being tracked for more than a year. We can look at movements related to weather events. Commissioners, remember when I spoke with most of you back in January and it was, where are all the ducks? 
we think it's because it's not cold enough to push them down, well, we'll know exactly where the birds are next year. We'll know exactly where they're at. Uh, we can look at uh, how mallards move, not just amongst our wetlands, but how they move with our wetlands and perhaps Missouri's wetlands or Arkansas's wetlands, and maybe we think at a bigger scale about managing wetlands at, at, at more of a regional level and not just a local state level. Our data that we collect, we could contribute to other universities that are doing this type of research. Uh, we'll be collecting location data on birds that are on the breeding grounds. We don't particularly need that. It's not a question that we have, but somebody's looking at that, somebody's asking about that, and we could provide data that will help strengthen their study. They might be doing the same. They'll, they'll be collecting location data on birds that are wintering down in Tennessee. They may not necessarily use it for their research, but it could help ours. So there's lots of room for cross-pollination uh, and, and collaboration with other universities, other agencies, and, and, and non-government organizations. So uh, there are a lot of moving parts going on right here. There's a lot of things that we can get out of it. And um, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna end it here and just say, uh, I hope at this point, uh, I'm seeking for uh, favorable support from the Wildlife Committee to move this forward and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you have because I'm sure there are plenty right now. I know I went pretty fast on that, but I had a lot that I wanted to throw at you in a, in a short amount of time, so. Yep. Up. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for you. I have several of my own, but I uh, appreciate that. And just to let the Wildlife Committee know uh, what, we're, what we're actually voting for or doing here is, is moving this uh, request to the Budget Committee just for clarification. So that's what we're going to do uh, once it's complete is take a vote uh, to move it to the budget committee for, for consideration there. Um, having said that, uh, questions from the committee? Go ahead, Tony uh, Sanders. Jamie, I know this is federal money. Which of the federal buckets is it coming out of? Um, that'd probably be the Pittman-Robertson money. Pittman, okay. Yeah. Second question is, is uh, the, the, the nice little graph, and just for everybody's record, I'm colorblind, so when you throw red letters and stuff like that, I don't see them. Yep. But I, I'm assuming there were some H's up there that you were talking about. Um, right there. Is this where the study's gonna be? Uh, yeah, primarily, to, it, we're looking at West Tennessee, yes. Yes, just for logistics. Um, sure. I know we had internally, we had some discussions. Can we expand it over into East Tennessee? Because I think, yeah, we've got some really great questions about how refuges and wetlands function over there as well. But logistics wise, I, that, if you'd like to throw more money at the, at the study, then we could, act, we could do it. <laughs> so, uh, so really just for logistics, it makes sense for us to do it in West Tennessee because of the concentration of hunting, uh, the concentration of ducks, the refuge locations and and the proximity to the um, Missouri, Arkansas, and some of the other states and and, and, and things like that. Since you brought up money, I'm a, this is a pretty big study, right? Yeah, this is. Um, yeah, I didn't say it, but uh, this, if we deploy 120 sat GPS satellite transmitters, yeah, GPS transmitters per year for three years, that's you know 360, that will be the largest GPS transmitter study. It'll actually be the largest telemetry project ever done in, on waterfowl in North America. This will literally be the biggest telemetry project ever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, more, more money makes it a better study, not bigger, makes it better. Uh, Commissioner Box. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for the presentation. Very thorough. I appreciate that. Um, just a couple basic questions. I think you said it was a four-year study? Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, it's a four-year study, actual... three years of field right. data collection, okay. yes. So we, you said, you know, the ducks are next year. You will get update annually, kind of what's been... Oh, yeah, absolutely. As far as information? Absolutely. I, you know, I think we're, we'll, we'll probably have them do annual reports for us, to, and then uh, certainly I would come back and if we, could, we can keep the commission updated on how the project's going for sure. Uh, I, I absolutely thought that that would definitely be in the process. So, um, but, but yeah, I, I envision 
if, if we're deploying transmitters and we're getting information on this, you'll be able to look online every day and see where your birds are at and, okay. and, and you'll know what's going on. But, but yeah, as far as all of the other things about, you know, the habitat evaluation, things like that, well, okay. absolutely, we'll, we'll come back to, and, and, keep, and keep you all updated. This for is sure. great, 30 minutes from my house. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other uh, committee questions? Uh, I have a few, so I'm gonna yep. go ahead and dive in. Um, you mentioned disturbance level, uh, and, but you only referenced uh, the uh, bird watchers as an indication of what a disturbance. I was wondering what mm -hmm. another disturbance level, uh, because we don't allow hunters on refuges now, mm -hmm. so what would you consider a disturbance level outside of that? Well, there's, in talking with uh, law enforcement and legal, there isn't any reason that we couldn't have hunting on the refuges. So if, if there's a possibility that we could allow limited hunting, uh, we could do a youth hunt. Maybe one day, maybe one day a month we could just get out there. But that's what we would need to find out. At what level can we do that? I think experimentally at first, it would just be staff members going out and discharging guns. We're just out there shooting, simulating hunting. We wouldn't be hunting, but we would just, you know, be shooting off guns and getting birds up and stirring them around, simulating what it would be like if the area was hunted. And oh, so, like so you could have that level that. of disturbance. I'd like to go simulate that on the refuge myself. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Uh, the solar GPS, as you mentioned, yep. that there are two years uh, uh, before they power down I guess they lose their yeah uh, ability do you have uh so we got we're doing a three-year study and you're doing 120 per year right yes sir what is a mortality rate expected out of out of that well we we, we just don't know uh, that's something and that's why we want to deploy that many because we know that there's going to be some mortality um and so we need to make sure that we put enough transmitters out there so that we get birds staying in Tennessee. We're going to put we're going to put we're going to put these transmitters on birds. Some birds are going to get shot. Some birds are going to leave and go to Louisiana. Um, but we need to make sure we have enough going around. That's why the number is that's why it's a big number to make sure we're hedging our bets to make sure we're getting those numbers there. So at this point, we don't we, we think if, if we deploy 120, we're going to be real happy if we get 80 functional radios that will give us good data in Tennessee. So, uh, you know, what, 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 what's that about? And the first deployment would be when? Uh, if, if the commission approves this, we will get a contract in place with Tennessee Tech beginning in July 1, and we are shooting for field season this year. We will be deploying the first satellites during the first week of the first GPS transmitters the first week of November. So we would deploy uh, scattered throughout the season. We would go, we would put some out in November, we would put some out in December, and we would put some out in January. So that's also hedging our bets. You know, we'll be able to track birds longer throughout the season. We'll get early migrants, we'll get later migrants, we'll get winters, uh, you know, winter residents. Um, so, so, so really that's the plan is to, to really capture lots of birds throughout the season to see what they're doing. All right, and uh, I guess, <coughs> excuse me, um, you said you're going to measure their health. Is there something on the GPS unit that is measuring that, or are you just measuring it when you ban them? Yeah, when we, when we <coughs> capture the birds, those health assessments are going to be done when we capture the birds. Uh, it would be fantastic if we could um, capture some of those birds again the second year and take a look at them again the second year. Obviously, there's no guarantee with that, but really, it's, it really, those health assessments are just being done on birds we capture at that time. That's yeah. what I assume, but it wasn't real clear to yeah, me. Sorry about that. And then is there a, a hen to drake ratio that you have planned? Uh, we don't have a ratio set yet, but uh, we do know that we want to deploy on both. Yep, we yeah, want to put transmitters on both. The concern being that uh, the hens mortality in the nesting grounds is, is higher than the drakes. Right. And, and so your tra transmitters are more at risk on the hens than, than the drakes. So yeah, I was just curious if y'all had a, uh, a number in mind. Uh, not at this point. Okay. Not at this point. All right, a any other commission members have questions? Jimmy? Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. It was a very thorough um, presentation. You listed four or five specific 
deliverables. Mm -hmm. Are there any goals um, other than this information? Like, we'd like to get to 20% of the of the ducks instead of 18%. Well, excuse my voice. No, I. <coughs> I mean, no, it's, a, it's a lot of yeah. money. I mean, what, what would be a, a good goal? It's certainly the goal, the goal is to, is to make sure that we are managing, so we're at record populations of ducks right now. We know that in order to sustain record populations of ducks, that we need to be able to provide really good habitat and lots of it. And so that, that's, that's really the goal of this. I, I don't think we have a goal of increasing our wintering population by, by X percent. I mean, I think we could say that, but, and it's a lofty goal, um, but it's, it's not, I think at this point, it's not how I had envisioned it, but it's certainly something I can take back and think about, you know, a specific measurable goal. I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, when we do make goals, we should make something that's very specific, something that's measurable. And so uh, that's a point well taken that, that I hadn't considered up to this point. Um, and I, 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 can, I can get back to you on that. But, but no, at this point, no real number changes, just information about how, air, how the ducks are moving around and, and, and how that information fits into how we need to manage for them. Thank you. Yep. Any other co uh, commission uh, questions? Uh, questions from the public? All right, is there a motion to move this to the budget committee? I'll move it. Right, we've got a motion from uh, Commissioner Stroud, Chairman, uh, and uh, Commissioner McLaren is second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, and against? All right, we move to the uh, budget. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks. And uh, I guess, Jamie, you're up again. Yeah, I got another one. Okay, again, thank you, Commissioners, for having me up here. I'm going to chat with you a little bit about uh, a proposed uh, enhancement that we would like to do on Three Rivers WMA to sort of set you up about how we got here. I got a call from Ducks Unlimited uh, a, a while ago. They, they said to me, hey, we have a major donor. He's got a, a fairly sizable amount of money that he'd like to have spent on wetland conservation, uh, specifically in West Tennessee. Um, do you guys uh, want to partner with us, and do you have a project? And so uh, we, as, you know, as an agency, we met with uh, folks in Region 1 and came up with several projects and came up with this as a priority project for Region 1. Um, just to zero, zero you in on where we're talking about, Three Rivers uh, WMA is uh, on the Obion River. It's in Obion County. Zooming in a little bit closer, it's part of, of the Upper Obion River Management Complex, and so it's a, a component of several different management areas that we have along the Obion River. Uh, you can see it's located um, on, uh, if you follow Highway 45 West out of Union City South, uh, it's, it's between Union City and Kenton. Zeroing in a little bit closer, the, the, the particular area we're talking about for the enhancement is the, the property that's on the eastern side, the east side of Highway 45 that's adjacent to that duck hunting area. And so that, uh, just so you give you a little background on, um, on the area, it, it was a, a mitigation bank for Tennessee Department of Transportation and they transferred that property to us in 2005. The total area is about a uh, little, uh, little less than 1,600 acres. That east portion that uh, I zeroed you in on is about 500 acres, and but the project area we're talking about enhancing is about 180 acres. And and it, and if this project goes through and we do this, uh, it should provide uh, definitely provide some additional waterfowl hunting opportunities on the property. The approach that we'll take with this is that we'll contract with Ducks Unlimited for them to create some shallow water impoundments. 
uh, utilizing the existing topography that's on the area. So no, not a lot of hard groundwork needs to be done there. Uh, they'll develop five units that we can turn into hunting areas. Uh, and it'll basically be low levees and water control structures that'll give the area manager a better ability to control the water levels that are on the, on the property. Right now, I think they're just uh, subject to uh, mainly uh, ha um, overflow uh, from, from the Obion River. So if the Obion River's up, the area's flooded. If it's down, it's not. So this will be able to, this will give us a, a, the area manager a better ability to control those water levels. Uh, so Ducks Unlimited is going to bring $150,000 to the game on this. They'll be doing the engineering design. They'll be doing the contracting and the construction oversight, all the site preparation. Uh, basically, they're going to be doing all the work, you know, um, to, to get those uh, low levels, uh, low level, the low levees and the water control structures in. Total cost on this project is $600,000. Agency commitments $450,000, so we're matching Ducks Unlimited money with federal aid money. Again, this is 100% federal funding. There's no state, no license dollars involved with this project. Um, and what we expect to get out of this is, is um, that the area manager will be able to better, uh, more effectively, more efficiently manage the wetlands on uh, Three Rivers WMA. It should definitely provide some increased hunting opportunities and uh, viewing opportunities on the area as well. And so uh, at this point, looking for uh, your favorable support of this project to move it to the budget committee and I'd be happy to entertain any questions on that. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, just to remind everybody again, we're gonna just move this to a budget committee is what we're voting on. Uh, Commissioner Stroud. Question. Yeah, so um, we would uh, we would engage in a contract with Ducks Unlimited beginning July one. They have told me that they should definitely be able to get this work done before uh, the beginning of hunting season this year. Yep. Yep. Other other questions from the commission or committee? All right, and uh, you said probably more hunting opportunities. What what is yeah. the problem with stating that there will be more no, is there, there will be there, more hunting opportunities okay, on the area are there yes. blinds out there draw blinds out there uh on this i'm not familiar with this particular yeah no there, there are no uh, so larry armstrong is here uh is the area manager so i'm, I'm going to be saying things and looking at larry to get affirmation from him um there are no blinds on the area right now the area is currently not hunted correct So, yep. 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 Right. 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 So, so at this point, it's opportunistic hunting on the area. By having the levees and the water control structures, we should be able to guarantee water in there, and they should be guaranteed spots every year. And I think uh, what we are proposing, so there will be five hunt units there, and they would go into the, um, the handheld draw for that, that, that they do for the Manus Swamp unit there as well. So really it's just, it's, it's five additional hunt opportunities in the hand draw um, that would accommodate up to an additional 20 hunters uh, per weekend. Is that correct? Because we, we, we draw for the weekend on that one. Um, so we would definitely be providing guar uh, some guaranteed additional hunting spots. All right, so currently is it boat in, weight in, uh, four wheelers? Uh, how do they access it now when the water's there? Hey, Larry, would you come up to the microphone? <laughs> this one right here in the center is fine. Thanks, Larry. Right here is fine. Thanks, Kirk. Yes, yeah, so right now, it just if the backwater's out, it floods, and depending on the water level, would <coughs> what they would use to access it. Usually, the water's maybe be pretty deep, so they would have to put a boat in and, and run out and, uh, and, and hunt from the boat. If the water gets down to where they can't access it by boat, and there's still a little bit of water and the river hadn't all receded all the way down, they would have to walk in. Uh, we don't allow any four-wheelers at this particular time on the area. So, so if you levy it up, um, and, and the boat access would be a five o'clock in the morning, would all be walk-in? We would call it a walk-in area, but uh, my plans would be to build a ATV road to where they could access all five units. They would be able to get to the units uh, by ATV 
put their uh, decoys out and whatever blind materials they'd be using. Uh, if we use the same strategy that we've been using on other areas, they would hunt Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They'd be able to put their uh, decoys and things out on Friday, hunt Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, starting out. So that now we have other areas that are hunted uh, Monday through Thursday and Friday through Saturday, but I would propose starting out slower, see how things go with the Friday through Sunday. If we see that uh, we're not we're still going to be able to get a quality hunt. Then we could add the Monday through Thursday. Uh, but if we start out all at once, it's hard to go back. Yes, sir. I understand that. All right. Um, does this give you the ability to pump as well, this this particular project? The way the or project is written right now, there's no whales uh, in the project with the 600,000, I believe, that we're suggesting. So you just catch water or relift or? we would uh, have to catch water, rainwater or when the backwater gets out, we would catch it and hold it. Uh, that's the same scenario we have with the uh, Obina River WMA, the Main Swamp hunting area. That's why we have a handheld draw because we can't go into the computer draw because we don't have guaranteed water. Yes. If we had guaranteed water, then we could put it in with a computer draw and because uh, we know we would have water if we had whales. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any you. other questions? Thanks, Larry. All right, thank you. And uh, at this time, well, I guess we'll, we need a. Mo uh, okay. We need a. Uh, is there a motion to uh, send this to the budget committee, the Three Rivers? Make a motion. Second. All right. Motion from Commissioner Sanders, second from Commissioner Box. Um, all the in favor say aye. 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 All against? All right, the ayes have it. It goes to a budget, and thank you, Jamie. Thank, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I'll turn it back over to the chairman. Um, or you just want to take a break now before we proceed on? Yeah, we'll take a break. It is uh, 2.15, so we'll try to reconvene at 2.25.